Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly interview show where top chess players, authors, content creators, and accomplished amateurs discuss their careers and share stories and chess improvement tips. Perpetual Chess is a part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network, and we'd like to give special thanks to our presenting chess education sponsor, Chessable.com. For more information about the show, you can go to perpetualchesspod.com. But without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We are joined here by two returning guests, two friends of the pod. Uh, first, I will introduce FM Nate Solon. He is a FIDE master, rated over 2,400 USCF, a data scientist. He is a chess, I guess you could call it, blogger. He has what's called a sub stack, which basically means like a free chess newsletter that you can have emailed to your inbox. I forgot to confirm this, but I believe he was also Massachusetts state champion. True or false, Nate? True. At least the game 60. There's a few different ones. Um, good I enough. One of those. Yeah. Good enough for perpetual chess. Yeah. Massachusetts state champion. So welcome to the show, Nate. Uh, good to have you as always. Thanks. Excited to be here. Yeah. And Nate, for listeners uh, who did not catch it, did a book recap of Zurich 1953, which was named as one of the favorite books of our other returning guest, who is a grandmaster, the 2001 Sanford Fellow. He won the 2000 U.S. Junior Championship, 2007 Spice Cup, two, co-champion of the 2006 Foxwoods Open. He's an author, a chess trainer, now a chessable author of the Grand Prix Attack Reloaded for White and Together. They are the co-authors of the new and forthcoming book, ev- slash forthcoming, I should say, Evaluate Like a Grandmaster. Welcome back to the pod, Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein. Hi, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good to catch up with both of you guys. And I've been checking out your book, and I'm excited for it. I mean, it's it's really good. Uh, you know, um, so let's dig into it. But let's start by kind of taking a big picture perspective of the impetus to write a book about how to evaluate. Why is evaluation important? And you guys can both start talking at the same time, anytime you want. All right. I guess okay. let me start first. Um, the idea was a little bit random. Um, as you probably know, and maybe your audience knows that I co-authored my very first book, uh, chess openings for white and for black explained with Jinjin Albert, I want to say 2005, so really a long time ago. And that was a repertoire book, whereas uh, Evaluate Like a Grandmaster is a completely different idea. And the way the idea was formed is Nate and I were just kind of discussing your podcast, Ben, with uh, Matthew Sadler and uh, how Matthew was really influenced by the new um, neural network engines. And the one thing that he mentioned is he wished he understood and worked on evals more in his youth. And Nate and I were kind of reflecting on that. And we're like, are there any books that teaches us how to evaluate? And we couldn't really come up with any concrete books. We just know many books mention this concept, but there are no you know, puzzles that we could think that actually uh, like a workbook format that one can solve. And we decided, well, why not do it ourselves? Yeah. And again, it's a great book. And you guys didn't just stop with a book of like 300 puzzles, all of which ask you to evaluate a position. You approach it from different angles. So Nate, anything, if you have anything to add about sort of the genesis of the book or about how you decided um, on the different formats of the puzzles, I'd be happy to hear it. Yeah, for sure. I think... Um... Basically, from from the computer chess perspective and also human chess, you can divide chess into two sort of big pillars, like calculation and evaluation. You know, calculation being crunching through moves, evaluation being at some point you have to stop, kind of look at the position as a whole and say, who's better? And yeah, it just struck us that it seems like there's quite a lot of books that evaluate the calculation side and, um, excuse me, that emphasize the calculation side, fewer that emphasize evaluation. Um, I, I did find out there, there's one by Dan Heisman, which is really good, actually. Probably He's probably been on the, the podcast. Yes, he has. Well, yeah. Great coach. But um, definitely way, more, way, way more books on the calculation side. So we felt like the evaluation side was kind of underrepresented. Um, as, as far as the different kinds of puzzles in the book, um, overall, what we try to do is start relatively simple. And then as you go through the book, kind of gradually ratchet up the complexity and also the game, you know, the, the 
make them more and more like a real game situation. So we start with just, you know, a position on the board, evaluate this. What do you think is the evaluation? Then we move up to visualization where you start from a position, but that's not what you're evaluating. We give you a few moves to visualize so that gives you a little more challenge, a little more realistic. Um, and it's, it's pretty much always good to work on visualizing because that's something you have to do in basically every chess position. Um, then from there, go to comparison where you're, you have multiple options that you have to evaluate and compare together. Um, so that's probably the most game-like because that's really what you're doing all the time in a real chess game when you're making a decision. Um, and then the, the last chapter is something that's, that's a little more unusual, but I think it's pretty helpful, which is what we call quartets, where we have four positions that are related but slightly different and ask you to evaluate all of, all of them. So that's really about kind of fine-tuning your evaluation of a specific position or structure. Um, I think I kind of got that the idea for that one from backgammon, which, like, if you hang out with backgammon players, they, they'll bet on, like, the evaluation of a position, and they'll make slight, you know, they'll say, okay, well, what if you move this checker from here to here? How, how would that change it? Um, which is not something... Uh, chess players really do traditionally, but I think it's a great technique to kind of hone in on what really matters in a position. Um, and computers make, you know, the, it's something is a lot harder to do before computers because with, with a computer, you can set up any position you want and basically instantly get an evaluation and analysis that is going to be, if not a hundred percent correct, at least extremely informative. So, um, you can just move things around, change details about a position and see how the, see how, how it would change. And I think you can learn a lot by doing that. Yeah. I really liked that section. It was highly instructive and original. Like you have these positions where like a uh, light squared Bishop in like a French structure or something um, where, where the pawns are all on light squares and black's Bishop is just hemmed in. And, you know, you might have an example where in one position, the bishops on the board stuck behind all its pawns in a fixed structure. And then if you just remove it um, and obviously remove a commensurate minor piece with the other side, like to see the difference in evaluation or even as a thought experiment, I found it uh, quite interesting. Yeah. So I, I commend you guys on, on, on the originality of the idea. I think it's, it's very instructive. And, and I, um, I think that, that was, that's probably the most sort of out of left field thing in the book. Yeah. Yeah, but but well thought out, like I said, and and I've heard like as you guys mentioned, um, there aren't a lot of books uh, of this vein, and I've even seen people on on Twitter and stuff, and in you know Facebook groups and stuff saying like, is there a way to practice evaluation? And of course, uh, one other book I should mention is uh, you know Mickey Adams was recently on the pod, Think Like a Super GM, and as part of their puzzles, obviously this will, this book came out after you guys started yours. Um, they do have you like a component of it is to judge evaluation. So I think you guys are on to something, um, and I really like that this one like drills down specifically on it. I found it pretty instructive, but um, generally, like, uh, and either of you guys could take this. Was there like a certain re like minimum rating? audience in mind for the book? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. So um, the one thing that was our number one focus for the book is to make it as accessible as possible for a really wide audience, which is really tough uh, when you think about it, because obviously with mates in twos and threes, uh, it's a little bit more straightforward, whereas with eval and um, how to evaluate positions, it's a little abstract. And I think what we really focused on is to um, approach it from several elements. Number one is we specifically choose a lot of games from uh, club players themselves playing. So I went, for example, in, through the database of hundreds and hundreds of games of club players rated roughly 1400 to 1900. And a lot of the mistakes that I saw I thought was really instructive. And so many puzzles are specifically taken from those types of games. Um, other puzzles are taken from Nate's games and my, my own games that are kind of very dear to the heart from our students, of course, my students, Nate's students. And um, of course, 
a little bit of modern games, like how the neural networks are influencing decision making of players such as Carlson, Ferruja, uh, you know, all, all these upcoming super GMs. And uh, I decided that we also need a little bit of classics. I'm not sure, Ben, if you noticed, there's a couple of really famous games in there. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, short Timon comes Timmen. to mind. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> so I feel like a lot of uh, astute readers will immediately notice that. But I feel like there is an element of chess culture that's present as well. Um, and we really want to kind of throw a lot of these different examples of players. And in terms of just an order of difficulty, we sort of try to make it less difficult puzzles in the beginning, a little bit more difficult then, but there is no concrete, you know, step-by-step -step approach, do this before that. I think it's more, uh, you know, you're in the practical game scenario. This is the position you got on the board. You know, this is your turn to move. How do you value it? and suggest the move kind of thing. Uh, this is what we're really aiming at. Yeah, and we should say, it wouldn't be much of a book if it was just like you present the puzzles and then you just give like 0.6 and then it's like on to the next puzzle. Like the, the, the value of the book is really in the explanations of the positions and you guys do a good job like going deep on, okay, white is better, but why is, is white better? Um, and on the topic of evaluation, one thing that Nate, you had written about in your newsletter is you don't like the traditional valuation system. And obviously that kind of like that thesis, uh, you know, carries through to how the book is presented. So hopefully a lot of listeners are subbed to Nate's free newsletter. If you're not, I can't emphasize enough. You really should be. Again, it's free. All you have to do is submit your email address. And Nate always has thoughtful pieces um, about various, mostly chess improvement, but also chess sort of data type topics. But anyway, Nate, so I know you don't like how computers evaluate or at least how the valuations are presented um, when you do like a game review on chess.com or Lee Chess. Could you uh, enlighten our listeners as to why that is? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so it's it's not so much the computer evaluation as as the metric itself, you know, centipons or pawns, basically that that 0 0.7, 1.4, whatever, whatever it is um, that it spits out. Um, I think that metric doesn't make nearly as much sense as a lot of people think it does because it's when when you take something that that you know you know came from a computer and it's a number and it has like decimal points and and stuff I think people assume it has to be very scientific but um I don't I don't think it's really sort of as objective and useful as it seems it's it's something the computer uses internally to compare different positions and obviously it works for that. The computers are really strong. They are right. You know, they, they will beat you. They, they will, if they say a position's good, it's good. Um, but the specific sort of scale and format of that number, um, I think is, it's not really tied to anything like supposedly one point is one pawn. But if you look at positions it you can find, you know, especially with the newer ones, it's like one pawn up and it's saying plus three. Yeah. So, um, I, I think these these numbers aren't aren't really sort of as scientific as they seem, and they also the other big thing is they change quite a lot between different versions of um, different engines or different versions of the same engine. So I don't think um, basically that cent upon metric really gives you a scale that's meaningful and that can be compared between different positions um, uh, and different engines in a consistent way. Um, so I think what we use a lot in the game is actually quite quite old school, which is like the, I, you know, you some people call them like the informant symbols, like plus equals slightly better for white, plus plus dash, better for white, which is much more coarse grained, obviously, um, because it's you're not getting into like these decimal places. You just have a few symbols to work with. But I think in a sense that's a more human and sort of honest evaluation because it's it is course dreamed. It sort of acknowledges that, well, as humans, our, our evaluation is not that precise, precise, but the most important thing, Ben, you already said, which is, which is really in the, the answers. That's where you actually get the detail and the reasons of why it's, it's better for one side or the other. Um, I think that's really where most of the value is. So that, that just plus equals that sort of 
puts a button on it and le lets you check um, your own evaluation against something that's very simple and uh, defined, but then it's really in the, the extended answers that you get into the meat of it. Yeah, and and they, I do feel like you guys raised really compelling points about sort of the flaws in the evaluation system that we've come to embrace. And this also came up in my interview with Grandmaster Matthew Sadler, as you alluded to, like the, um, they seem to be getting more extreme, which makes sense since outcomes are binary, but that doesn't help us humans. You know, like I've had more positions recently where when I review a tournament game, it, it's even material. I feel like I have an edge and it turns out I was plus three. And then I feel even worse that I didn't win, you know, but like in a, in a human sense, it's not the same as being up a piece, you know, like when I'm up a piece, like I'm, you know, uh, I'm probably going to win, you know, whereas some positional edge that the computer says is plus three in a human game, at least at my level, like there's no, no guarantees. So I commend you on that. And I do think it was a, a good approach, but of course it gets me thinking, it's kind of like, why doesn't the US switch to the metric system? You know, why don't we concede defeat? Like it's, once it's ingrained, it's it's hard to switch. Yeah. So I I, uh, I I really approve of it, but I have a, I have a feeling it's gonna be hard hard to unwire myself. Yeah, and that's actually, we, we did draw the line of the, the evaluation system I like more is the Leela style, which is, which is on a negative one to one scale. Um, where negative one would be 100% chance of win for black, one right. definite white win. So I think from a data and numbers perspective, that makes way more sense. Um, but like you said, we're, we're pretty deep into this center sent upon thing. People are used to it. So, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't try to force people to work with the Leela number, um, for, for this one, we just, we just use those informant symbols, which I think are, you know, really simple and, and easy to understand and, and mostly just explanations in, in plain English. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I do think it was a wise decision and we should say that Leela, funny enough, like often if you use the Leela engine, it's converted back to the air mm -hmm. quotes pawn system because that's what people are used to. Even though I agree with you that percentage of win would be better. Although as you talk, as you've written about Nate, like even that, like it begs the question, well, like what's the percentage chance that who wins? Is it the percentage chance that Magnus wins? Or is it like the percentage chance that my six-year-old daughter who, you know, just knows how the pieces wins? Um, so, you know, there's no perfect system, but it, it was good that you guys uh, gave it a lot of thought. Yeah. One thing I want to add to that is, uh, and I tweeted about this, is there's no concept of difficulty when it comes to engine evals. So, uh, and a lot of club players, you know, when they play either online, they review their game and the engine said, yo, double question mark move. You had a move that's plus nine and you played a move that's only plus three. But actually plus nine move may require you to calculate extremely difficult sequence and you may blunder something. Whereas plus three, you just convert to some easy king and pawn end game that eventually you will win, you know, with your eyes closed. So. There are a lot of these kind of nuances when it comes to uh, human decision making that the engines are sort of useless. And um, I believe there should be a secondary factor, you know, when the engine shows you, you know, plus equal or plus minus or whatever, the, the difficulty factor, right? If yeah. The only line that you have to calculate that, you know, five, six moves deep, or here's a very simple move, you know, you have a risk free position which is only plus equal, but now you have 10 moves, right? That maintain that plus equal with the relatively risk-free um, style. Yeah, and as I believe Nate has written about, we've, re we've reached a point in sort of the evolution of engines where something like that would be more beneficial to the vast majority of users than like the next 50 points, you know, like whether whether Stockfish is rated like 3,600 or 3,650 at some point, like f f they're so far ahead of humans that it's nice to know, but um, but it would be better to uh, have more of a bridge of the way to, to use these engines. And yeah, that sort of idea of uh, how to, like realizing your equity, how how likely are you to win the position is, um, yeah, there, that's a, a big hole in the way that engines are currently presented, especially for, uh, for club players. Um, all right, we have a question from the official brain correspondent of Perpetual Chess. 
uh, friend of the pod, Dr. Christopher Chabri. So this is related to the book. And then, of course, Nate and Eugene both have done a lot of interesting work uh, and played some interesting chess uh, outside of the book. So uh, we'll be moving on to uh, to other topics soon. But but this is an interesting question from Chris. So he, here it is. He asks, many exercises and puzzles on evaluation or positional understanding can't be solved by, quote, static evaluation. They require some calculation, generation of good candidate moves, and knowing when to stop calculating. This is, of course, realistic, since in a game you never know for sure that quiescence has been reached, and you can just start to evaluate without calculating. How does your book address this issue? Does it have exercises specifically to help you assess when it is, quote, safe to evaluate based on static features rather than continuing to calculate? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, this is this is a great question. Um, and yeah, he's, he's absolutely right. This is a big challenge. I guess the first thing I would say is, you know, of course, it's not um, possible to completely separate separate out moves and evaluation like i think willie hendrick said in his book you know argued that it's impossible to think about a chess position without thinking about moves mm -hmm. so it's not um it's never you know just in the same sense that it's it wouldn't be purely calculation with no evaluation it's also not 100 percent evaluation no calculation it's just sort of shifting the emphasis um and i think as as far as getting up to when to stop we we sort of get at that with this increasing difficulty level in the chapters because for you know for the first chapter it's like you kind of know well i'm already at the stopping point with visualization we're still giving you some help because we're, we're giving you the line you don't you don't have to figure it out from yourself but you do have to visualize it and then with comparison um we're increasing the complexity more and giving you a little less help like you might sort of want to continue some of those some of those lines starting from that initial fork in the road. Um, so I think it, it sort of gets to that. And just inevitably, as you evaluate, you're going to be thinking about concrete moves to some degree. Um, although, yeah, Chris, Christopher's question does have me thinking of like, if we could have sort of targeted that skill even more specifically with, with some other kind of exercise, I don't know, I'll have to think about that one more. Yeah, we'll save that for the sequel. But I will say, um, in a few days, I'm supposed to interview uh, Grandmaster R.B. Ramesh, who has a new book out on calculation, and he talks about this concept as well. Um, so, and that interview may actually come out before our interview. So, uh, Chris, if you haven't heard it already, that, that'll be one to listen to, because I'll, I'll ask him about sort of guidelines um, as well. Um, so, before we hit other topics, guys, uh, one thing we should say is uh, we're recording this, I believe it is uh, June 4th. Um, the book is, you guys are putting the finishing touches on this book, um, but we should say we don't know when the interview comes out. The book may not be quite available yet. So what can listeners do if they want to find out more about Evaluate Like a GM? So yeah, we've got, um, we've got the website evalgm.com where you can sign up um, to get updates. So that definitely works. Um, if you follow either of us on, on Twitter or my newsletter, you'll also for sure get the updates. Um, but yeah, my, my, my wife is due next week. So we're, we're really trying to crank it out soon, but we don't, we don't have an absolutely fixed date, but. Okay. Be yeah. June. Yeah. Yeah. And as, as I said before, you guys should all be signed up for Nate's free blog anyway. And if you are, then any good blogger who releases a book has to like relentlessly um, <laughs> flag their book, flog their book to, uh, to their audience. So it's hopefully that, you'll do your job that, there. That's Nate. what they say. It's like you, Everyone coaches you to, to promote it relentlessly, which is a little uncomfortable, but I guess that's what <laughs> yeah. you're supposed to do. Right. Um, well, anything else to add about the book, guys? Because there's lots of other topics I want to get to. Chess improvement and Eugene's story of uh, playing Magnus in a f over the board a few years ago, and uh, on, the list goes on. Yeah, I guess, Ben, the one kind of small add-on, especially to uh, Chris', Chris question, is there is a little... Uh, segment about my coaches in the book where I talk about Jinji, uh, Zaitsev, uh, Alex Vitkevich, and Dorfman. And I sort of like tie in how they influence my thought process and my evaluation skills. And the one thing that is very, very common, and I also notice it with me and, and, and with Nate and my students, is when you show position to your grandmaster, they almost know immediately what to do. Like whenever I was playing, I showed my game to Jinji. Within seconds, he wasn't there during the, 
during the game. He wasn't thinking for 20 minutes per move. Within seconds, he's like, oh, you do this, this, and this. You trade these pieces. Oh, yeah, here you do. Like, this constant, like, knowing what to do in every position was always present with the top guys. And I feel like even now when I was coming up with puzzles and I would show it, well, to Nate, well, Nate, obviously this is the right move. He's like, well, well, now that you say it, it makes sense. But, like, to me, it wasn't obvious. And then when I show it to my students who are even lower rated than Nate, for them, they're... They, they're even confused. What, what, what do I mean? This is obvious. This is not obvious to me at all. So I think there is like almost like a layer of, uh, uh, of, uh, of every stage that the chess player has to get through, that some things are obvious and some, some things are not obvious. And hopefully this book will sort of address uh, um, or just expose different uh, ideas, right? How one looks at the position and what are the important factors and what are not the important factors. Yeah, I, I think it does. I mean, again, I'm I'm friends with you guys, but uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't praise the book uh, if if I wasn't impressed with it. Um, so I'm I'm I went through probably about twenty five percent of the actual exercises and read the pros, but I'm eager to do the whole thing um, in due time. I think it it'll, it'll help my game a lot, and I think uh, as you guys alluded to. Um, it's for a wide range of players. I would say the visualization section is going to be the most challenging for anyone rated like, I don't know, below 1400. But the other three sections are standalone for absolutely anyone. It can be a good exercise. And even that one, some of them are only like some of the visualization exercises are only like a move or two. And then you evaluate. So, um, yeah, strong recommendation. But guys, we got to get to some other topics. So uh, first, we're going to take a quick break. And then next up, I want to talk some chess improvement because uh, there's lots of... Uh, Great ideas that Nate has from his blog that I want to bounce off of uh, both you guys. So we'll be back momentarily. Listeners, it's finally here. Sharashevsky's Endgame Strategy, one of my favorite chess books of all time, is getting the chessable treatment. Revised and expanded, and the video presentation is done by none other than 2018 U.S. champion Grandmaster Sam Shanklin. And guess what? They have a free one-hour video that you can check out on the principle of two weaknesses done by Shanklin himself. So that's just one of the many offerings from Chessable.com. They also, of course, are constantly dropping new opening, end game, tactics courses, all of which feature their proprietary move trainer technology to help you uh, remember what you learn. So the links for anything mentioned, as always, are in the show description. So be sure to check out Chessable.com for Endgame Strategy and all of their other new material. And we are back and we're ready to dig into some good chess improvement talk. I should mention both Eugene and Nate were both on How to Chess. They both had uh, very instructive episodes of that as well. Uh, Eugene on How Not to Blunder and Nate on How to Use Analytics in Chess. So recommend listeners go and check out that content as well. Now, Nate, your your blog often touches on chess improvement, and you've got some good takes. So we're going to call this section Nate's Takes. You ready? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so Nate's Take number one, you had a really cool chess improvement checklist in one of your uh, blogs a while back that I really felt like synthesized a lot of the same sort of, you know, obviously I get asked about chess improvement a lot because I interview uh, so many people about the topic, and you would sort of come to some of the same conclusions as I had about uh but said it better than me about like if you try to shorten a chess improvement task list to its bare bones uh, i felt like you did a good job doing that so could you share what that checklist contained yeah thanks yeah so this was kind of thinking about you know i think a lot of chess discussion maybe especially on chess twitter is sort of like optimal training um but but to me like optimal is tough because if you're going to say like, you know, is it optimal to um, do 50%, 50% studying and playing versus 40%, 60% or like, is it optimal to do puzzles that where you can get 70% of them correct or 80%? Um, realistically, I think we're just nowhere close to being able to answer those questions. So I think it's more important just like, are you doing something reasonable? Are you doing something, um, that you enjoy, like, are you doing something that gives you a decent chance? So that, that was sort of the motivation of the post. Like I was thinking of it as like, like minimum viable training. Like what's, mm -hmm. what's the simplest thing you can really say that makes sense. 
Um, so I came up with these five things. We'll see if I can actually. <laughs> I have them if you remember. need them. Okay. But... Yeah. So I'll, I'll probably be able to remember them. So one was, I, I don't know if I'll say them in the same order. One was playing, um, like, I think I called it high stakes games, serious games, which, you know, I, I mostly mean like over the board tournament games, but I do understand that people have different restrictions with their location, with their time, with, um, you know, COVID, of course. But Basically, I think it's it's really important to have some sort of game where it's kind of above and beyond your normal. So it's not it's not just a throwaway game. It's not you know probably an online blitz game. Something where the context of that game is going to help you to be more focused and more engaged. Because um, that's sort of that's when you put it all together and get get sort of tested. And I think um, for most people over the board tournament, just being in the tournament hall and being in that atmosphere, you're just going to be able to summon a much higher degree of focus and intensity um, than you could even, even if you just try your absolute hardest to really take an online rapid game seriously. For most people, I think it's, it's a completely different level. Yeah. All right. Well, first let me, let me, I agree with everything you said, by the way, strongly, but let me just read the five things. Okay, uh, yeah, that's what first. We'll probably just to summarize all of them. That's a good idea. Yeah. Well, I think uh, some exposition is good, but just to get, get them in people's heads, I'll just quickly read them since I have them in front of me. Number one was, uh, do you work on chess every day? Number two is, do you solve challenging problems? Number three, as you said, is do you play games with real stakes, which again, ideally tournament games. Number four, do you review your games? And number five, and this is important, sometimes overlooked, do you have a community? Um, so yeah, I really felt like that got chess improvement to its essence. And it, I think it's like a good sort of um, signpost for someone who might feel like they're struggling. Like I was telling you guys before you were recording, I'm playing a decent amount of tournament chess, but I deal with, you know, the same or more of the struggles than many of the people I interview and in that I feel like my motivation ebbs and flows. And like, if I don't have a tournament on my calendar, I find myself uh, slacking a bit. And I do feel like this checklist is like a good, uh, again, like a good signpost. And Eugene, when I had flagged this for you guys, you mentioned that you had also read this post. Um, is there anything lacking or noteworthy from it to you from these uh, five uh, questions to ask oneself? No, I really uh, also enjoy this post, and I believe this ca kind of captures the essence. Uh, the the one thing that I want to stress to a lot of, you know, club players or players who recently started uh, picking up chess after a long break, um, that online chess is completely different from OTB chess, and a lot of players kind of look at their online games, online ratings and just how they solve tactics online and kind of use that as a basis for going to an OTB tournament and then have completely different result than their expectations and may even get upset because they're like, well, you know, how come I'm, I'm like 2000 rated online and I get beat by this, you know, 12, 1400 kid. <laughs> uh, this is very common, right? We already, t you probably already mentioned about different scales of ratings online and OTB. But the important thing is to really have realistic goals and, uh, you know, judging by online uh, statistics and ratings, people may have wrong expectations. Yeah, well said. And I've seen people, again, um, my primary community, and there's many ways to build community. We've mentioned uh, the various discords out there. Obviously, Chess, Chess Dojo is one of them. Um, um, and having community is good for me. It's more chess Twitter and you see people on chess Twitter. I've seen like, uh, Omar, uh, chess von doom is a fun follow. And I've heard him mention like after he goes to a tournament and I've seen an, a few other people, they're like, Oh, now I get it. You know, because Omar was struggling with like really obsessing over his online rating. And now he can obsess over his OTB rating instead. <laughs> um, so, so he's made progress in that regard. And, and, yeah, I mean, and again, as Nate said, financial life circumstances sometimes get in the way of uh, of playing over the board, but it does have a way of leaving like an indelible imprint if you forget an opening line or make some sort of blunder or or something like that. But yeah, I definitely recommend this post. I'll, I'll link to it, and I think um, it it really does cover cover the essence of uh, of what is needed for 
improvement. Now, Nate, another one of your greatest hits can, can in I my just, mind. Say, say just a little bit more about I, I yeah, yeah. The, the first and last one, like the first one, do you play chess every day, essentially consistency, and the last one being community. Um, I think there, there's sort of an attitude of like no pain, no gain in chess, which which has an element of truth, but I think the pain is a bit overrated in that, yes, you definitely have to challenge yourself, but if you max out the challenge all the time, you're going to burn yourself out. Um, and what's really important is consistency. So if if you don't have the consistency, you're not going to improve. If you do have the consistency, you don't need to be going nuts and, and you know, doing the absolute hardest taxes you can for hours every day. Um, as long as you do something every day that, that challenges you a little bit, um, I think you, you are going to improve. And the challenge is really to stick with that consistency where you do actually do it every day for long enough where you can see the results. Cause you're not, you're not going to see the results in a day or a week. It's going to take months, right? At least. Um, so I think that's where the, the last one community comes in where this is often missed because chess is like the competition part of chess is quite solitary. You know, only you are playing that game, but in terms of improvement, the, the community gives you, a lot of stuff, you know, it gives you the accountability, it gives you additional perspectives, it, it, it keeps it fun, so it helps you maintain that consistency. So I think those those two um, maybe are overlooked, but are really important. Yeah, well said. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. And uh, another post that really struck a chord with me, Nate, was about... Um, how well club players know their openings. Um, you you wrote a while back, you know, you get this impression from corresponding with students and people online. Everyone feels like they have to be just absolutely booked to the teeth. Um, and you actually looked at the data uh, using the Lee Chest Explorer of uh, how much theory people know at various levels. Like when is the game leaving theory? And obviously something like the the Lee Chess database is a great resource to actually get to the, the truth about that. So could you share a little bit about what you found, Nate, when you dug into that? Yeah, this kind of kind of came out of just overall I felt like there was a big disconnect between what a lot of people were saying and what I was seeing in actual games. Um both my own games other games, just, just looking around at nearby boards at tournaments, my students games, just basically like, like it seemed like there was this enormous fear that my opponents are booked to the teeth. Like I can't play main lines because if I play main lines, my opponents will know everything. Um, that, that seemed to be what people were feeling or afraid of, but what I saw, you know, in my own games and like, I'm, you know, I'm like 2,400 USCF playing players of a similar level is, usually one or both players out of book very quickly and kind of improvising. And that was the same thing I'm seeing in the boards next to me where other masters are playing definitely, you know, in students games of lower ratings. So it's just, I'm just, you know, I don't want to dismiss what people are saying, but, but this, this idea that everyone knows everything in the openings, I'm just not seeing it in, in any games except maybe grandmaster level games. I think this, this sort of game that everyone's afraid of where your opponent knows everything in the opening they know the whole middle game plan and they just put on this sort of clinical performance. You never have a chance. Um, I've almost never seen that in a real chess game. Maybe, maybe the super grandmaster level sometimes, but I think the reality of chess games is there's way more possibilities than you can memorize sooner or later, usually sooner you're on your own and you have to play chess. So I think the sort of anxiety of, about how much your opponents are going to know in the opening is, is a little bit misplaced. And, and in this post, it wasn't, it wasn't super scientific. I just gra- grabbed a, a handful of random games on Lee chess. So it was more kind of qualitative. It wasn't like a large scale analysis, but it did basically confirm what I had already seen from lots of different other sources, which was people were going out of book early. And, and, you know, it really just came down to who spotted a tactic or who played the middle game together better. There wasn't, um, they're just, I, I just really was not seeing these games where, where people rattle off, you know, 20 moves of theory and that's the deciding factor in the game. Yeah. And I want to get, 
I feel like you got a little pushback on that post, Nate. So I, I want to hear about that. But Eugene, I'm also just curious how how that take lands with you, how Nate's take lands with you. Um, do you agree that that people maybe fear uh, tons of theory? I know you work with players uh, across the spectrum, as you've said, Eugene, from like 1400 to 2700. How booked up do you see people like, say, below, especially 2000? But I encounter it at the 2100 level, too. I'm out of book before move 10, at least half the time, I feel like. Yeah, no, that's a really good uh, point. I I also feel like it really depends. Um, just to give an example, um, so my student who is like a 2200, he's in his 50s, he played this 11-year-old kid who whipped out, you know, 20 moves of theory of some King's Indian line, and my student got in trouble and lost the game. Um, you know, and the kid was like rated 2000. <laughs> so hmm. I would say that it really depends. Um on an opening and on your level, you know, if you are under fourteen hundred, this is probably not the primary concern. Your your primary concern is not to hang pieces and not to get not to make strategic mistakes, as opposed to remembering move by move theory. But even if you're fourteen hundred and you play an opening, you know, let's just say I'll be blunt and I'll use my Grand Prix attack uh, course. Hmm. Uh, where you know the main strategic idea of the opening, you actually don't have to remember move by move sequence. You know, if you know yeah. the plan, put the queen on e1, h4, play f5, bishop h6, knight g5, 90% of the times you're good to go. And when people learn openings, and I specifically stress that myself to my students, if you don't understand a move that somebody, even myself, recommends, stop and try to figure that out. Don't go deeper. So if I give you 20 moves of theory, and you're stuck at move five, and I tell you play this move, and you don't understand why, don't just blindly trust me. Ask me a question. Why this move? Why not that move? Until you can understand enough that you can explain it to your friend who is in the same rating range. And this is where the plus equal, uh, plus minus equal sign uh, that we're talking about uh, with. Yeah. I think you mentioned that, right, uh, James? Yeah, well, sure I'll, I, we that. haven't mentioned it today, so I'll yeah. hop in and explain. This is yeah, um, something explain. that... Yeah, that James Altucher mentioned when I interviewed him. He's written about it in his book, Skip the Line. And uh, he's the uh, USCF master and the student of Grandmaster Jesse Cry. And I know that Jesse uh, latched onto it and made a separate amusing video about it. So I'll link to that video. But basically, the idea of plus minus equal is you have peers to practice something against is the equal. Um, you have a teacher um, that you learn from. And but this is kind of the one that sometimes gets overlooked. You also have um, you also have someone that you teach um, so that you're forced to explain your ideas. And Eugene, I think you had written it might have been in your chessable course or in an email to me that that you you realized yourself in your work that uh, that having to explain ideas sometimes uh, uh, identified holes in your knowledge. Is that where, where did I see you right Oh, that? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, this is exactly my point. When I was doing my chessable course, which is, you know, the Grand Prix Reloaded course we're talking about, if I, you know, explain a certain line, certain idea to a student, and I get confused when they ask me a question, well, what about this or about that? I feel like if I can't answer that right away, that means I don't know well enough. I should dig deeper in understanding these positions, these structures myself. And that sort of exposes areas where I need to work on. And if I can explain it clearly and answer all these questions with examples, I feel good that I understand the material. And therefore, when I play the lines myself, I actually feel more comfortable uh, over the board. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a really good point. Um, Oh, and Nate, to bring it back to your actual post, because I, as if, if I recall correctly, you ended up doing a follow up because you got a bit of pushback um, from people who said, "No, no, it's not true. I do need to know tons of theory." Is a, is that is that what happened? Yeah, some people, um, some people did push back. I think so. Some people are like really attached to the idea of knowing a lot of theory. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what that is. I, I guess I would say like, I don't know. You know. If people have these games where, where knowing a lot of theory divided the game, I would honestly like to see them. So, like Eugene um, mentioned, the game of his student where where he played against a kid who who knew a lot, and I guess that was a factor. So, I'm not saying this never happens. I mean, obviously, some people do know a lot of theory, at least in some lines, so it can be a factor. But I guess I would say it's 
it's more um, the exception than the rule. I guess it's also, I think it also has to do with um, how openings um, have sort of traditionally been presented in books. So like, you know, if you go back to the Queen's Gambit, like she's carrying around that modern chess openings, like the big MCO. So it's this big book and it's like, some lines are in there and um, some lines are not. So I think what people internalize from that presentation is like the, the moves that are in there are like the approved good ones. And it, any move outside of that, like if my opponent does anything else, like they just deserve to lose the game. Um, so that's, that's sort of what you get from the way an opening book is maybe formatted, but that's totally not the reality of how chess actually works. You know, if you look at almost any standard opening position with an engine, usually there are many moves that are more or less fine. Like, you know, and and not only like the most common sort of theoretical moves. Um, so I think that the reality is just um, there are um, an absolutely insane astronomical possi- number of possibilities in chess. Um, a lot of them are pretty fine. A lot of a lot of moves are okay. Maybe they're they're a little worse than the best moves, but they're not going to cause you to lose the game on the spot. So I think people expect or want chess to be this sort of you know it's like like you're taking a test and you give the right answer and otherwise you lose. Um, but it's just that's not really the nature of chess. There's a lot of possibilities, um, and yeah, usually just just sort of coloring within the lines for the first few moves. Um, it's not it's not really what decides the game. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a sample of one, but you know, I've been, I, I, as we alluded to, I take my tournament games way more seriously than my casual ones. And, you know, I'm, you know, 2100, whatever. And I'm up to a sample of, I don't know, 30, 35 tournament games. And there was only one game where I was like completely busted out of the opening. There are probably none where I was like completely winning. Um, and, and for the record, I mean, my coach, Grandmaster Axel Bachman, he's, you know, my openings used to be a weakness, but now I feel like they're at least equal to my peers. When you run like the aim chess algorithm, my openings come out well. If you look at the engine evaluation, my openings are fine. So it's not like I'm bad at openings, relatively speaking. And anyway, out of 35 games, um, only one of them was air quotes decided by the opening. And in that one, I was dead lost, but I drew. So even the one that was decided where I, in theory, never had a chance, I didn't lose, I drew. Um, and I think that the lower you go, the more you're going to find that to be true, unless you fall for a trap in the Stafford Gambit or something. You know, there are like, there are more forcing lines that where you really do need to know a few things. Often they're not even the most sound opening. So you can occasionally get caught. But by and large, uh, Nate's right that if you just look at an engine there's lots of reasonable moves in most positions especially when you're not playing at eugene like a grandmaster's level where they can really punish these tiny inaccuracies yeah Um, just to amplify what eugene said um just the chances that you get any specific sequence are low but knowing what to do in the big picture like where do my pieces go what pawn breaks am i looking for what are what are the most common plans what trades do i want that stuff is super important because one way or another, you're going to get to a middle game that you have to play and just sort of having that sense of what you're trying to do in a given structure or or opening. I think that's, that's what, what, what is extremely impactful. Yeah. Well said. All right. And there's lots of red meat in Nate's post. So uh, I think we'll mostly leave it there. Although I do want to touch on a certain Magnus Carlson who Nate recently wrote about and Eugene played OTB. So we're going to get that story from Eugene as soon as we get back from one more break. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by AimChess.com. AimChess, of course, has an algorithm which reviews your games and gives you actionable advice of what aspects of your game to work on. I have a lot to work on. I've been in a blitz slump, so I was eager to check out AimChess and see which aspects of my game are struggling. It helped me with some specific openings I need to tighten up. I need to play faster. I need to blunder less. Honestly, I think a lot of it is tied to when I play. That also is a factor you must take into consideration. Are there distractions? Are you tired when you're playing? Aim Chess can help you isolate all these variables and give you actionable 
puzzles, and lessons based on the data that it gleans. And if you check out aimchess.com and decide to subscribe, you can use the code PERPETUAL30 to save 30%. So go have a look at aimchess.com and try it out for free. And we are back. And in my prior interview with Eugene Perlstein, way back in 2017, uh, Eugene had fairly recently played in the Reykjavik Open, of course, one of my favorite international tournaments. And Eugene, obviously, very strong player, uh, grandmaster. But he told the story of playing Anish Giri, who, of course, as a top 10 player in the world, is even on another level. And a few months after that interview took place, Eugene played over the board a certain Magnus Carlsen. So let's get the story, Eugene. <laughs> yep. So the setting is uh, Isle of Man. Uh, I hope a lot of uh, listeners know that this is uh, one of the biggest open tournaments where the strongest players all over the world play. Um, so I played Magnus in round two. It was an open tournament. Um, I think I was staying with Kostya Kavutsky. Uh, and a couple of other IMs, and Kostya in that tournament played Kramnik. And it's just like so many top guys that you can actually play. And I got to play Magnus in round two. I got my pairings. We were at a restaurant the night before, and people tell me, you're playing Magnus. How do you feel? And at mm-hmm. first, I was a little scared. Obviously, he's num- you know number one in the world. He's the world champion. I'm just this average GM. But also being scared, I was at the same time excited. And that uh, basically resulted in me playing with no fear. Because when you play a high-rated player, sometimes you go into this box, I'm white, do I play it safe? Do I play it aggressively? And against Magnus, I decided to just play chess, just play my normal stuff. And if he's going to play something offbeat, I'm just going to go after him. And that's exactly what happened. I did not, you know, I prepared probably like, half a dozen openings i played d4 and i expected some kind of normal positional grind and he played g6 he went for the modern and i took up the challenge and played e4 grabbed the center and we got an extremely super sharp tiger modern uh line where you know black completely abandons the center and uh i even sacrificed the pawn then i sacrificed another pawn I felt like I'm actually outplaying him. At one point, he, I think, spent like 30 minutes per move thinking. <laughs> that was like a memorable moment for me. But then somehow I just couldn't find a way to to uh, finish him off. It just felt like I'm better, I'm better, I'm better. But he's just defending really well. And I think I made a classic evaluation mistake that I just couldn't come up with a plan. And I was running, running low on time. And I decided to simplify and win a pawn in the end game, but my pawns were shattered and doubled, and that was a really bad decision because then Magnus is Magnus. He just started grinding me down from equal position, and you know he played this beautiful end game and won the game. But to me, it was a really instructive moment that, again, like I mis-evaluated the, the end game. I thought that I'm in no risk of losing, and obviously uh, he understood it on a much deeper level. So yeah. lesson learned, just like against Geary. Um, I did learn my lesson against Geary in the next year. I finished fourth in the Reykjavik Open ahead of many top 30 grandmasters in the world. So to me, that felt like I learned my lessons. Next time I play Magnus, nice. hopefully I'll do better. All right. Like to hear it. Yeah. And, and your the story you told in our first interview that, that listeners can check out about sort of like Geary's opening prep just being on a whole nother level. That's one I, I think about a lot. And it's funny that from Magnus, you get a different lesson, the, the end game being on, on a whole nother level. Um, so did you get a chance, Eugene, to talk to Magnus at all about the game? Um, only we chatted. Um, he, I don't, I don't think he was like in the habit of going post-mortem reviewing the games with people. We just chatted a little bit after the game. Uh, but the funny thing is, same tournament. Uh, I played, I, I don't remember who I played, and I was in the post-mortem room, and next to me was Anand speaking German to his opponent, reviewing his game. Wow. And to me, that was quite amazing. Like, you have Vishy, who is just a legend, right? Right now, he's, like, killing it at these tournaments. Uh, and uh, he's just sitting, like, casually talking German, analyzing the game with his German-speaking opponent. 
Amazing. Yeah. And you played some monsters in that tournament. You played David Howell and uh, Paco Vallejo as well, right? Eugene? Yeah, that's right. I played, uh, you know, these guys were 2,700 plus. Uh, I was white against all three, Magnus, Paco, and Howell. I lost all these three games, but each one had a different kind of story. Against Howell, I was outplaying him the entire game. And then he was also in horrible time trouble. But then he survived <laughs> in the end game. And then he thought, I want to say, because 60 minutes gets added for people who are not familiar with the long time control after move 40. He thought, I want to say, for 40 minutes and came up with this devilish trap in an end game that I fell for. And I even lost the game. And he even <laughs> said, oh, I'm sorry, man. Like, I, I shouldn't have won this game. So he was really nice about it. But uh, that was amazing how, uh, how tricky those guys are. Yeah, and it's funny. Howell always talks about his his time trouble. Like when I interviewed him, and you know, elsewhere, it's I find it very relatable. But it sounds like you know, I I mentioned my uh, my time trouble at my level, but it sounds like his is even more extreme. <laughs> like uh, his his uh, time trouble issues run deeper. Um, Maybe and Eugene, you let me ask you, Grishuk, then. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's that's a bucket list goal anyway. <laughs> Although uh, I don't know how likely it is to happen, but that would be amazing. Um, Eugene, uh, I recently caught up with Grandmaster Robert Hess. It actually hasn't been released yet as we record this, but uh, will be by the time this comes out. And he also was talking about playing in in the Isle of Man and how he, he got to play Anand. And he specifically picks these tournaments where he has a chance, he feels like, to play a legend. And I was curious, like... How, what determines what tournament do you play? You know, you know, you have a daughter now. You're mm-hmm. primarily a trainer. Is that your motivation as well? Or like, what is your motivation at, w- for the scant opportunities you have to compete over the board? Yeah, I think I would agree with Robert is that, you know, I sort of grew up on uh, this bread and butter U.S. tournament scene, weekend tournament, where these days, if I'm a grandmaster, I'm typically one of the top seeds in the tournament. And it's an open tournament. That means I get to play a lot of games, uh, people who are much lower rated than me. And the games do feel differently when I play people in the t- between 22, 2400 range, when I play people who are grandmasters and above. And the beauty of these tournaments like Reykjavik Open and Isle of Man is that these are not even grandmasters my level. These are like super GMs that I normally never face. So for me, it's like this extra challenge to be an underdog and uh, just kind of test my skills against the top guys. And I felt like I learned a lot just from facing 2,700 plus opposition. And I wish in my uh, earlier days, you know, when I was playing in the US, when there were not not as many top tournaments in the early 2000s, that I would play more in Europe uh, and trying to play these mega opens in Europe and try to really play these 26, 2700 plus GMs. Yeah. Uh, it makes sense to me that, yeah, that, that challenge uh, would be something to relish. I um, mean, it's a great attitude, as I mentioned to Robert. Um, now, on the topic of Magnus, Nate, uh, uh, another post of yours that I really enjoyed, and this one is quite recent, is Magnus recently deigned to play Title Tuesday, which uh, surprised a lot of people. Um, and you had a nice... Um, uh, pros post about it sort of wrote about uh, a few educational moments and also made a video because of course magnus won the tournament but what did you learn from going through his games where he kind of routinely beats these uh 2800 blitz players nate yeah i think it's i mean it, it it's quite relevant to to eugene's game as well because magnus entitled tuesday or magnus in um in open tournament i i just think it's really fascinating to see I mean, I mean, so many of his games are him against the other top 10 guys, but it's just so interesting to see how he thinks about um, playing against against players who are weaker than him. Like in that um, Isle of Man, he, he really mixed up his openings. Like against Eugene, he played one G6. In another round, he played one B6. He was playing he was playing a lot of weird stuff, so he seemed, seemed like part of his strategy was, was mixing it up in the opening a little bit, which was interesting. Um and yeah, as far as title Tuesday, so yeah, I, I just sort of started from like, he's playing against these really strong, you know, blitz players or, you know, maybe, or grandmasters or may, maybe IMs or FMs who are really strong blitz players. Like, how do you score, like, like what is he doing to be able to score nearly 100% against those players? So I think it's, 
what one thing I noticed is he was going to um he seemed to be steering the game towards I would say non standard strategic positions. So um in one round against um Tanya Sokdev, he went for this sequence where he traded a bishop for a knight to um double her pawns to create this sort of very weird, very imbalanced position. Um according to the computer, I think Tanya was still better, but it was like, it was a very kind of out of, out of the normal position where you can't just kind of close your eyes and develop. It's like, it, it's clear that something weird is going on in the position, but it's very hard for both sides to figure out what to do. So I think that's one thing he, he does is kind of, I, I, I was, you, you know, that famous quote about tall, take your opponent into a deep, dark forest where two plus two equals five. Um, Magnus kind of does his own version about that, but it's, it's not, tactical fireworks like tall it's it's positional it's going into you know these weird imbalanced positions where he he has such breadth and depth of knowledge he knows how to play them but he's taking his opponents out of their comfort zone so i think it goes back kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier about with your opening preparation of you don't necessarily have to memorize a ton of lines but you have to know the plans it's like magnus knows all that seems like he knows all the plans in every position he just knows where to put his pieces how to play those improving moves that are so key in blitz. Um, and, but, but he takes it in these weird positions where his opponents are a little bit lost. Yeah. Well, Peter Hein Nielsen on the, the chicken chess club, Peter, of course, being um, Magnus's uh, head trainer. So he does a lot of opening prep. And in some of these online events, Magnus likes to play these goofy openings. Um, like I, I don't even remember, but like one C three and uh, the list goes on, but he was saying like, Everything that Magnus plays, they are engine checking. Like even when he plays these these air quote silly lines, like he's looking for the best version of that silly line. So there's a whimsical nature, I guess, to the way he approaches these openings. But he's not just like making stuff up. It's it's interesting. He had um he had a great game that I really loved a lot. That um I think it was from the Olympiad maybe a couple of years ago where he started with one e three. Um, th- this is the game where. He, he told his teammates that, and I think it, like Hammer said, he realized what a punchable face Magnus had when, when he, he was <laughs> playing right. with 1e3. But um, it ended up transposing into something, I, I, I forget, some, some other structure where Magnus also, you know, it's just like all the ideas were so perfectly on point. Magnus, it, through some weird series of transpositions, it ended up in the main line of, I think, a Nimzo, some, some other Nimzo line which Magnus also knew perfectly. And I, I, I really love, love to watch his banter blitz as well. Cause I think you get the sense of what you were saying, Ben of like, even when he's doing this weird stuff, um, it's kind of principled in a way, like he's really thinking about the logic of the position. Like if I've done a and B, what's the C that kind of follows for that. So it's, you know, for him, it's not just moves. It's very, um, the ideas are very connected. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's fascinating to to see Eugene. Do you have anything to add about uh, Magnus's opening approach? Yes, and I would actually second that. I'm a big fan of watching Magnus uh, banter blitz sessions, and sometimes I'm shocked by how little openings he knows. And mm-hmm. a lot of times he's like, "Oh yeah, I don't know what to do here," or "I forgot my prep there." But he basically understands, like Nate said, pretty much every single. Uh, pawn structure, every single opening, uh, all the top GM games that ever built played. His memory is amazing, as you can probably watch some of his YouTube recalls of famous positions. And he just sort of says, in these positions, typically this is the plan. and right. Or in this position, my plan is to do that. And he kind of talks like in a very simple terms that everyone can understand what the ideas are. And he almost makes it look too easy almost like Capablanca simplicity style. And he wins a lot of games this way. Yeah, it, it is. It is amazing. Uh, yeah. And it, it is, you know, you watch it and you feel like you can do it. And then at least I, I can't <laughs> as it turns out, but it's, it's still fun to watch. Now, Eugene, on the, on the topic of openings, you've got your new chessable course, Grand Prix attack reloaded for white. And in this one, you came up with a new move on move five. 
Um, now, Eugene, of course, you're known, as you mentioned, you've um, you co-wrote Chess Openings Explained, and that's been a very popular series. And uh, you had a website where you shared some theory. You did every gambit refuted for chess.com. So you know your openings. When you sit down to write a chessable course of all the openings in the world, how did you pick this uh this novelty against uh, uh, within the Grand Prix attack against the Sicilian? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, the funny thing about this novelty, it's not really a novelty if you look in the database. This move A4, I think, has been played, I want to say, 75 times. But in the bigger scheme of things, the move Bishop C4, the old Grand Prix, or the Bishop B5, our original recommendation with Jinji, uh, both of those moves combined were, I believe, like, 18,000 games. So that gives you pretty much scale that move A4 is completely fresh and new. But what yeah, I love about... Should give, we should give the moves just for anyone who... Uh... Yeah, so the moves are E4, C5, and then the close Sicilian or the Grand Prix start with the move Knight C3. And then Black typically answers with Knight C6. And now, because the Knight is still on G1, White gets to play F4 to set up the kind of the King Pawn Storm that eventually happens. Black typically fan shadows with g6, and then white plays knight f3 and bishop g7. So this is the standard Grand Prix position. And like I mentioned, the original recommendation is bishop to b5, attacking the knight, with the idea Nimzo style to take on c6 at the right moment, double the pawns, and then you play d3, and then you start the main attack with castles queen e1, and the queen can go to h4, f5, etc. And the old Grand Prix moves bishop c4, but Bishop c4 runs into this move e6, kind of like blocks the bishop. So my idea was neither bishop move, but to play just a very much waiting move, this move a4, which is not a developing move per se, but it is a very useful move for later. Like the pawn can uh, recapture back on b5 when the bishop is there, or the rook can get lifted to a3. So this is actually a very cool idea. And the thing about this is that if black plays standard ways around, you know, basically e6 or d6, uh, then black gets the, uh, rather white, sorry, gets the dream Grand Prix attack and sidesteps a lot of the equalizing lines. Uh, and so a lot of my students play the Grand Prix and they were basically telling me, oh, I'm not really getting my type of attacks after bishop b5, knight d4. And that sort of problem prompted me to do some research. Uh, thankfully, uh, to modern neural network engines, Leela approved my plan as well. And All right. I specifically use Leela and Stockfish. Of course, it's not like they give advantage, but they say position is very playable and with natural moves for black. And this is how I typically do my opening research is I sort of flip the board around and I play seemingly natural moves. You know, I take black. And this is how Jinja taught me to analyze openings. And then every game, Leela just crushes me. And I'm mm -hmm. kind of picking up those ideas. I'm like, okay, this is new. This is interesting. This is interesting. And then it sort of comes together as a conceptual setup. And then once I have the conceptual setup ready, I start testing it with my students and in Blitz. And after that, I use all of that material to create the chessable course. Yeah. Um, and I have to say, even though I've, I've always played Knight D4 against Bishop the uh, five bishop b5 in the grand prix i seem to do okay but i don't like playing against it so eugene i'm a fan of your work but i don't really want people playing this i don't want to deal with any more grand prix lines so but uh but yeah it was <laughs> as i mentioned i watched the intro video uh of of you going over it and i was it was big suspense what your fifth move was going to be and i did not expect a4 but yeah i mean it, it is a useful waiting move i can totally see how if i were playing black and had not checked it out um i would get an unpleasant position, um, as I often do against the Grand Prix. Um, and, so. and as an add-on, uh, especially these days, a lot of people say with so so much opening theory and engines are getting better and better, a lot of people say, well, there's no more room left for new ideas in chess, right? Everything has been discovered. Uh, but that's not true. Uh, I, I want to refer to listeners to an interview you might have done with Kazim Zhanov, who was many years Anand's and Karwana's second. And Kazim Zhanov who you know, probably doesn't need to, to be introduced. He's probably one of the most uh, famous I, uh, ideas guy for, for both Anand and Caruana. Remember Caruana's famous win against MVL in the candidates in the, in the Nydorf? So yeah. with modern engines, the move does not have to be the best move. 
it has to be just enough of a surprise for your opponent, right? And as long as it doesn't like get you into a bad position, you can explore and come up with these ideas on your own. And that's how most uh, 2,700 plus GMs are working these days. They don't look for the best move. They look for the move that A, surprises their opponent and B, gives them practical chances. Yeah, Fabiano in particular has highlighted that point, of course, having, you know, obviously no longer working with Rustam Kashinjanov, but, you know, uh, being of a similar mindset, having worked together. And this will probably come out while the candidates is ongoing. So it'll be interesting to see if that carries through when obviously the stakes are extremely high for the players to try to find, uh, you know, the ideas that can can catch people most off guard. Um and Eugene, briefly bringing it back to the book and to your discussion of your coaches. Now, in our prior interview, you mentioned you you told some anecdotes about Dorfman, Jinji, and Zaitsev, um, but you did not mention Alex Wojciechowicz, who, of course, is a U.S. legend. May he rest in peace. Um, and you had you had a few uh, sort of some fun color on your interactions with him. So maybe you could share a bit of that with uh, our audience as well. Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh... Alex Vaitkevich, or Wojo, as we call him, he is quite a quite a character. And the day, uh, you know, a lot of people may remember, he he was a weekend chess warrior. He would play nonstop, and uh, in a lot of these open tournaments. But what's particular about him is when I first met him, he was already in his forties, and I was studying at UMBC at that time. UMBC was a big chess. Uh, squad with, you know, strong GMs. He actually became a student, I want to say, for a year or so. And it was quite an interesting (laughs) character because he never went to his classes and he actually failed Russian choir, I believe, which he never went to and got kicked out of the program. But, uh, you know, imagine (laughs) this uh, bohemian type of uh, chess player in his 40s who just travels the world uh, hanging out with 20 year olds at college. Yeah. It must've have, could have been its own movie. Yeah. And he was known in those days. He played a lot in the action events at the Marshall. Yeah. And as you say, uh, heavy drinker and a smoker. And unfortunately it probably contributed to his, his early death, but, but what a chess talent. I mean, he's just such a natural. Yep. And the ideas that he came up with, uh, because we worked a lot of openings, he's a big, uh, hyper accelerated dragon fan. Like I am, also, he's a big Catalan player. He kind of played the same lines. Uh, his repertoire was quite set, but he knew them almost to the point where he would just sit in front of me with a chessboard, and in a chessable style, he would just show me every move and all the ideas behind it, which was like invaluable lesson, both in how one understands and approaches the opening and just like his sheer understanding of the material. Because back then, of course, there was no chessable. There were... You know, it's not like he had chess books anywhere in his house. He didn't have any chess notes other than his own games and and his ideas. And to me, that's one thing that I sort of, again, picked up from him and from Jinja, that these were, are, you know, exceptional talents that were driven by ideas and concepts, kind of like Magnus is when you watch Magnus Banter Blitz. They were not so much about move by move kind of guys. Of course, modern chess theory requires you to prove your ideas with moves, but they were more of an ideas guys who sort of like said, in this position, you just do this. And, you know, he just showed me some setup and it was a little bit odd at first, but once you get it, once you understand the concepts, like in these stonewall setups, you want to trade the, uh, as white, you want to trade dark square bishops, or if you are facing like the birds and the reverse stonewall, you want to trade light square bishops as black. Just that statement, just very simple concepts went a long way for me to approach and openings and general middle games. Yeah. And I can't remember if it was in your Woj section or your Jinji section, but one of them led to you sharing a game where you crushed Greg Shahadi. And I'm always glad to see that (laughs) appear in a book. So yeah, shout out to Greg, who is, uh, you know, we go way back. He, he, that was actually a game in uh, U S junior championship in 1998, maybe. I could get my year wrong, but yeah, it was uh, the Grand Prix attack. I played the Bishop B5, Knight D4, and the game entered a very unusual sequence where I had the uh, tripled pawns, tripled isolated pawns, and he had two bishops in an endgame. 
but his king was exposed and he actually uh, walked into this very nice attack and sequence where he walked his king all the way from e8 to e2 and got made it and uh, that was one of my best games in that tournament i love it all right um just one more topic i think guys um nate we've been threatening to do a, a standalone adult improver interview with you for probably going on two years now and still haven't managed to make it happen but we should say you are quite accomplished in that area um i believe it was the 20 you've gone from i believe uscf 2200s to 2400 um in your 30s which is quite rare um for, for listeners you know the 150 points or whatever it is may not sound like much but when you're at that level again it's uh it's quite rare. So, Nate, could you share a few greatest hits from that? I know you, you've you uh, framed it in the past as a lot of it being sort of based on sort of a professionalism of your approach slash lifestyle being uh, key keys to your growth. Yeah, I think so. So, I mean, I started playing chess when I was a kid. Um, I was sort of, you know, I played a lot in middle school, kind of starting to drift out of it in high school, mostly stopped playing in college. Then... Um, like, like you, Ben, I, I played poker, you know, professionally for, for a number of years. So it was only, it was sort of a few years ago that I got back into playing tournament chess. Yeah, I think I was, I was in like the mid, high, mid to high 2200s um, when I started playing again. And I did, so my current USDF rating is a little over 2400. Um, so yeah, I was, I mean, I was, I was proud to sort of make those, especially because since I was playing in the Boston area, um, a ton of my games were against kids in like the 2000 to 2200 range. So, um, yeah, it's not that easy. Like it's not that, e you know, it's, it wasn't like I was like farming like old guys on their rating floor for points. It was, it was not right. letting. Um, yeah, I think, I think poker taught me a lot about like sort of mental game, like keeping an even keel, having like a study consistent study routine. Um, so I think, yeah, being, being more sort of, consistent like emotionally not getting too high on wins or too low on lows um i think i think that was big um i think play like prioritizing playing against better better opponents helped me like one one thing i did at one point was um um purchase some packages of um to to play training games against um liam kwang lee which was I mean, maybe overkill to some extent, like, like I didn't need <laughs> such a strong opponent, but playing a lot of rapid games against a strong opponent and, and like being, having access to him to be able to ask him questions was, was really helpful for me. Yeah, I found that interesting. And it does get back to your five improvement tip checklist in that, like you found a way to make it a serious game, even playing online, because obviously if you pay to play like a world-class player, um, you're going to take that more seriously than like your, your random game from like the Lee chess rapid pool. And obviously listeners like, you, you know, you might not need to go purchase a game against a 2,700 player, but if you're rated 1400, even, you know, you could, you could pay to play a training game with a master for probably 10, 20 bucks. And maybe that'll, that'll get you fired up. So, um, did find that instructive. And and Eugene, last time we were here, you mentioned two books as being formative. Well, one, of course, the classic Zurich 1953 that mm -hmm. Nate and I did a podcast on and even talked to Andy Soltis so in subsequent years um, about. And then you mentioned Perfect Your Chess, which, of course, was mentioned by FM Peter Giannatos. Mm -hmm. It's a very advanced book, I'd say master level. I mean, Peter was about 2100 when he did it. Um, do you have any other, I, I want to hit you guys both up for, for book recommendations before we wrap up. So Eugene, do you have any to add to that? And then I don't believe I've gotten Nate's before. So I'd like to do that as well. Yeah, definitely want to add to that list as I was, uh, you know, researching, uh, evaluation books for our specific upcoming book, the two books that, uh, were really powerful, I believe are, uh, you already might have had this uh, reviewed called the Questions of Modern Chess Theory by Lip Lipnitsky, who actually, the book is published in 2008 in English uh, by Quality Chess, but he actually wrote the book in the 50s. And to me, that was astounding how many ideas uh, that are quite relevant to today he, uh, he mentioned in that book. And they're actually... Uh, one or two puzzles 
uh, from that book that with the modern twist that we gave in our book. Uh, so keep an eye for that. And the second book that had a big influence on me uh, is Positional Decision Making in Chess by Gelfand. It was the first of the series of books that he did with Augard. And uh, he actually talks about his own games, but in a historical context where he compares the ideas all the way back to Rubinstein, who was a big influence on him. And I really love that, like how like sort of chess evolved, right? You have this modern uh, super GM talking about his own games, yet he makes a very, very specific relevance to the super old games that are still relevant to this day from a positional point of view. And one of the main uh, concepts that I believe is quite new in that book was the concept of space and space advantage. And uh, I can elaborate more on that, but this is definitely an area people should uh, should go in to check out that book. Yeah, fantastic book. Um, yeah, and what, what resonated for me from uh, uh, what you mentioned about the space advantage there was just the idea of uh, how that impacts like uh, trading pieces, decisions to trade pieces. Exactly. It was a, mm-hmm was not a framing I had seen before, but I mean, I'm sure it was out there at least like in Grandmaster conversation. And uh, Nate, we know you're a bibliophile, both chess and otherwise. So um, what are some of your favorites? Well, I think I definitely want to shout out a few that are great books and that were also um, inspiration for our book. So I think I already said um, Dan Heisman, who's, you know, who's a great coach that I really admire. He's one of, he wrote one of the few books I've, I'm aware of that already exists that is explicitly about evaluation. Um, so that's good. His, his book, his is more, I would say that book would even make sort of a good companion for our book because ours is more of like a puzzle workbook that's really based on examples. Kids has quite a lot of, you know, explanation, which is really good. So I guess you could say maybe his is more of the theory. Ours is more of the practice. Um, but his stuff is great. And then, probably the other biggest influence on us was um, Jakob Agard's books, which, which are of course really great. Um, You know, targeted more at advanced students. They're very, very hard, but really good. Um, So those are, I would, you know, when I, when I was working on my chess more like my own chess more a few years ago, I was working on those books. Um, Trying to think of what, what else I was working on at that time. Um, One that, one that I, I remember looking at, is um, the Domination book by Kasparian, which is one of these huge books that looks very intimidating. Um, but I was working on that when I was making some rating games. And I think I, I like that one because, yeah, it's it's a thick book, so it looks a little scary, but um, the individual uh, exercises are not too terribly hard. Like I find studies are often prohibitively hard. Um, that book is not is not insanely hard, but um, the studies are really elegant, and I think I think it teaches you about peace coordination. So that's that's another good one. Yeah, uh, that's a classic. I've heard I've heard that one recommended a lot. And Eugene, you told uh, I was reviewing our prior interview. I enjoyed the story about your dad, like uh, giving you like a small amount of money for every end game. End that's game right. Study yeah. solved. I love solving <laughs> studies, and this is one of the kind of trick that I use with a lot of my students who hate end games is that when you solve end game studies, it's actually, you know, you're learning not just calculation and peace coordination, but you do learn end games really well. And typically in my experience, uh, people who did a lot of end game studies, they later become pretty strong end game players. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Definitely noticed that as well. And we should say that, unfortunately, with Domination, if you look for it on Amazon, the publisher is uh, no, the publisher that you get it from, Ishii Press, has quite a dodgy reputation, and the book is known to be sort of replete with errors. So, I mean, obviously, if you buy it, you know, you'll still get most of the studies, which is the primary goal, but you, you may want to try to track down a different version if you can. And this is, again, fairly advanced material, I would say. Uh, um, if you're below 1800, you might want to start with something like a uh, friend of the pod, Kostya Kovutsky's uh, Endgame Studies 101, um, which I'm sure draws from that as well as many other places. Um, 
All right, guys. Well, I could keep you all day. You know, I could interview each of you individually for for hours, but I think this this might be a good place to wrap up. Um, do you, uh, Eugene, have have anything to add before we say our goodbyes? Uh, not anything specific. Uh, again, thank you, Ben, for having having me on the show. Uh, I guess one thing I do want to mention again for people who want to check out our book that if you go to evalgm.com and just put in your email, you will get the sampler. If you want to get an idea of what the book is about, and the sampler will have a little bit of everything of all the uh, chapters, including the quartets, and you can try your hand at it, and then you can see the answers, and uh, you may get excited. Okay, yeah, and again, strong recommendation for the book. And uh, Nate, anything to to add? Um, I don't think so. I think we yeah we covered the book, we covered the blog. So um, yeah, just thanks for for having me. It's always always. So, so much fun to talk. Definitely. Yeah. And again, listeners, Zwischenzug is called the, is the sub stack. If you swear, search like Zwischenzug, Nate Solon, I'll also put the link in the show description, but I can't stress enough. It, it's free. If you get it in your inbox, you could always skip it, but I, I read every one and I know uh, Nate has a lot of fellow fans. So definitely recommend listeners check that out. And then uh, that will make sure that will ensure that you don't miss the book or anything else uh, that comes out. All right, guys. Well, thanks again for we're doing this on a Saturday. Um, so uh, Eugene and I should get back to our families and Nate should get back to his soon to be family. Yeah. <laughs> um, so thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. It was uh, fun as always. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Big shout out to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank the Blue Wire Podcast Network, with whom we are proud to be affiliated. Be sure to follow us on social media, Beneficial1 on Twitter, at Perpetual Chess on Instagram, and or you can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can email me, ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to give major thanks to the Perpetual Chess Patreon and PayPal supporters. Those who choose to join that community based on their level of support can do things like submit questions for guests of the show, have access to live Zoom Q&A lectures with grandmasters who often have appeared on the show going over chess games, answering questions, stuff like that. And you can even get access to ad-free perpetual chess if that's your preference. So, but most of all, thanks to everyone for listening and we will catch you all on the next episode.